packed up here live and in person, uh, then you get church at 10 o'clock on the dot. Uh, we're glad that you can be here with us as we gather with God's people. Uh, of course, people are looking at their watch saying, it's not 10 o'clock on the dot. There were technical difficulties. Uh, we've been travelling in the book of Acts. Some of us think it's been for two months. It's actually been closer to 12 years. This is season six. Uh, season six, we, we divide it into six parts, and boy, has it been an amazing journey. I'm not going to go over the whole book of Acts, but in season six, we saw the Apostle Paul arrive to Jerusalem only to be arrested, which he suspect, suspected would happen anyway. Uh, he was uh, tried before the Sanhedrin, but then under threat of death was rescued uh, by the Romans of all people. He flashed his Roman citizenship and that gave him protection and it moved him through the Roman courts. There was no real decision there and the whole time Paul seemed much more committed to defending the gospel and speaking about ri the risen Jesus than trying to get himself out of jail. As things went from there, he, was, he appealed to Caesar and so they said, well, if you, as a Roman citizen, you appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. So he was shipped off to Rome. How long does it take to get to Rome by a ship? Well, it takes about five months when you go at the wrong time of the year and you get stuck in a storm. Now, we've got a little bit of experience of that sort of weather today. Uh, Paul was shipwrecked in the island of Malta for three months uh, before the weather cleared and he could safely get to Rome. Which brings us, finally, at long last, after 12 years, he has made it. To Rome, that is the Roman imperial standard, uh, and so finally we can put that up there because we are almost at Rome. It's great. Paul is there, and is he going to defend himself or is he going to speak of Jesus? Well, we're going to see in just a moment. But I want us to hear from Isaiah chapter six. Uh, Isaiah chapter six is quoted in Romans in Acts twenty-eight, as you'll see, and Jared's going to bring us that reading. It's after Isaiah's had this glorious vision of God. morning everyone. Uh, as Scott said, our first reading this morning is Isaiah chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 8 to 13. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left destroyed and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. It's frightening words. Uh, we're going to hear more as we hear that from Acts 28 later on. Paul quotes that. Uh, we're going to reflect on our wonderful God as we hear a song called Rock of Ages. This was recorded by women from churches all over Sydney, from different denominations. Let's reflect on our Rock of Ages, our Lord God.
Father, we thank you that you are our rock of ages. We thank you that whatever life throws at us, that we can cling to you, that you are our refuge and our strength. Amen. Uh, we are going to continue into the book of Acts, but with an animation uh, from the Bible Project. And then straight after that, Jaron is going to bring us uh, the second half of Acts 28 before Pete Ryan comes to open it up for us. Now, now throughout, throughout this section of Acts, Luke, the writer of the story, has portrayed Paul's trials and imprisonments so that they resemble his previous stories of Jesus' trials and imprisonment. Luke's making an important point. When the people of Jesus follow the way of Jesus, their stories will begin to look like his story, which is beautiful, but it also comes with a cost. On the way to Rome, the boat carrying Paul is hit by a violent storm, and everyone freaks out. Except for Paul. He's below deck hosting a meal, just like Jesus did the night before his trial. Paul blesses and then breaks the bread, promising that God is with them through this storm. And the next day, the ship hits and then breaks apart on the rocks, but everyone's washed safely ashore. Which is amazing, but Paul's not out of trouble. He's taken to Rome and put under house arrest. But it's not so bad. In his house, he can host groups of Jews and non-Jews, sharing with them the good news about Jesus, the risen king. This is a bold move in Rome, the center of power where Caesar rules the world as king. Yes, you have Jesus' alternative upside-down kingdom now growing in the very heart of the world's most powerful empire, all through the suffering of a prisoner. And with this contrast between kingdoms, Luke ends his story. That's a great image, but the story's supposed to be about this message spreading to the ends of the earth. So shouldn't it continue? Of course, Luke has left the story open-ended on purpose so that his readers would know that the story isn't over and that they can participate in Jesus' kingdom that is still spreading to this day. Our second reading is the second half of Acts 28. We'll be starting at verses, verse 17. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. 
The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Good morning, everyone. Just uh, excuse me while I set up here. <clears throat> it's great to see you all here this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Peter, uh, and I'm very excited to have this opportunity to share with you from God's Word. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to pray, so please pray with me. Let's, let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you for today, for this new day, and this chance to gather together as your people, and we pray now, Lord, that you would help us. Please Help me, Lord, to explain your word truthfully and clearly. And please help all of us, Lord, to respond to your word with joy and trust and obedience. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> uh, this week I was reading a, an article about uh, final episodes of famous TV series. Uh, the author gave a list of what they considered to be the ten worst final episodes in TV history. And so the article was full of quotes from outraged fans furious about the final episode of these various shows. Now, I don't know, maybe we can have a show of hands. Do we have anyone here with us who stayed with the TV series Lost for the entire thing? Uh, just a couple. So that was one final episode that got a lot of attention. But even the criticism of the final episode of Lost uh, didn't compare to what some were saying about the final episode of a particular Japanese TV series where the writer of the series received death threats <laughs> from fans who were disappointed with that final episode. Uh, there's a lot of pressure, isn't there? on final episodes of TV series. If you've been watching a show for a long time, you can have great expectations on how it is going to end. And so we can end up sometimes being disappointed with the final episode of a show. Well, as Scott has mentioned, this morning we come to the final episode in the book of Acts. And I wonder, as that was read for us, what did you make of it? I think at first glance, this final episode of Acts can seem a bit anticlimactic. For the past eight chapters of Acts, we've been following the story of Paul and his arrest and his trials and his appeal to Caesar. And now, after years 
of court cases and false accusations and shipwrecks and snake bites, Paul finally arrives in Rome to face trial before Caesar. But then when we read Acts 28, we can be left wondering, what happened? Did did Paul get his day in court before Caesar? And if he did, what, what was the result? Was he found guilty and executed or was he exonerated and released? Luke doesn't tell us. Instead, the book of Acts ends kind of abruptly. And so this final episode of Acts might seem like a bit of a fizzer. But this morning, I want to suggest that this is a brilliant ending to the book of Acts, the the perfect ending, in fact. Uh, I want to show you why I think that. But before we get to that, first, let's have a closer look uh, at this passage together. Uh, If you've got uh, a Bible with you, uh, open up to Acts chapter 28, verse 16. Verse 16. Luke, the writer of Acts, writes this. When we got to Rome... Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When Paul arrives in Rome, he is placed under house arrest. In other words, he's staying in his own place, but he's being guarded by a soldier. And what does he do when under house arrest? Well, he invites the leaders of the Jews in Rome to come and visit him. Just three days after arriving. You might think that he would need longer than that to recover from the arduous journey that he's just been on, but Paul is not one for wasting time. So he gathers together the Jewish leaders and he tells them what has been happening. And what he says to them is a bit of a recap of what we've seen in the past few chapters of Acts. He tells them about his arrest in Jerusalem and his trials and his appeal to Caesar. And through all of it, Paul makes very clear that he is innocent. So in verse 18, Paul says, the Romans examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. I don't know if you've noticed this, but throughout these final chapters of Acts that we've been looking at over the past few weeks, one of the things that Luke has been highlighting is that Paul was innocent. And here we see the same thing again. Paul is innocent. Paul insists he has done nothing against the Jews and he has no ill will towards them. Instead, he says, he is in chains because of the hope of Israel. Paul's under arrest because he's been proclaiming Jesus as the one whom Israel were waiting for. That Jesus is the Christ. Well, the Jewish leaders are intrigued by what Paul says and so they arrange another day where they can come back and hear more of what Paul has to say. So in verse 23, we read this. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets. Now notice, this time, even more people come to hear Paul. Uh, This was in the days pre-COVID. And so you can imagine people crammed into this house, eager to hear what Paul has to say. And all day, Paul talks to them about Jesus trying to convince them from the Old Testament that Jesus is the king who was to come. Now, if you think about that, it's really just a very slight variation on Paul's normal ministry strategy. You know that expression, when in Rome? Well, it turns out that when Paul is in Rome, he does exactly the same thing he does in any other city. So think about it, all throughout Acts, when Paul first arrives in a place, what does he do? He goes to the synagogue. And he tells the Jews there about Jesus. But in Rome, of course, he's under house arrest. So he can't go to the synagogue. So instead, he calls the synagogue to him. 
This is classic Paul. So here he is, once again, doing exactly what got him arrested in the first place. He is literally in chains. The chains are jangling as he speaks. And yet he perseveres, proclaiming Jesus. And how do the Jews in Rome react? Well, we find out in verse 24. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Now, again, that's the same reaction we've seen all through Acts, isn't it? Some are convinced and believe. Others would not believe. Notice that it's their willful choice. They would not believe. And to them, Paul quotes from Isaiah, the prophets. He points out that they are acting just like their forefathers did. Their forefathers who refused to listen to the word of God through Isaiah because of their hard hearts. And then Paul says this. In verse 28, Paul says, Therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Again, this is exactly what we're seeing all throughout Acts. Paul arrives in a place, he goes to the synagogue, he tells the Jews there about Jesus. Some believe, others refuse to believe. And invariably Paul gets kicked out of the synagogue and he turns to the Gentiles. Because the message of Jesus as king and saviour, it's not just for the Jews, it's for all people. And so Luke tells us that for the next two years, Paul stays in that house and welcomes all who come to him. Look at me at verses 30 and 31. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul accepts all visitors. Whoever comes to see him, he welcomes and he tells them about Jesus. And that's the end of the book of Acts. Luke doesn't tell us what happened to Paul in the end. Was he released? Was he executed? Luke doesn't say. And I think that is a brilliant ending to the book of Acts. Let me give you two reasons why I think that. First, because the book of Acts is not about Paul. Luke never intended on writing a biography of Paul. Sure, we learn about Paul. We see how Paul is transformed from a persecutor of the church to a proclaimer of Jesus. We see lots of Paul in action, but ultimately the book of Acts is not about Paul. The book of Acts is about the gospel. It's about the spread of the unstoppable gospel from Jerusalem into all the world. Right back at the start of Acts, if you cast your mind back 12 years to the start of the series, Jesus says this to his disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that, that's exactly what we see all through the book of Acts. The unstoppable gospel going from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and all the way to Rome. In fact, this final episode of Acts, Acts 28, shows us this spread of the gospel in a sort of microcosm. Did you notice? Paul starts with just a few Jewish leaders, then he speaks to more Jews, and then finally he welcomes all who will come to him, and he tells them about Jesus. Paul's trial before Caesar, that may have been the way that God brought Paul to Rome, but ultimately what matters is that now that he's here, he's proclaiming Jesus. The book of Acts is about the spread of the unstoppable gospel, and all through Acts, Luke keeps reminding us of that. So in Acts chapter 6, we read, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Then in Acts chapter 12, we read this, but the word of God continued to increase and spread. Then in Acts chapter 19, we read, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. The book of Acts is all about the spread 
of the gospel. And Luke wants us to see that the gospel is unstoppable. So think about it. Think back over the book of Acts. We've seen plenty of hurdles thrown in the way of the spread of the gospel, haven't we? Those who were proclaiming the gospel were imprisoned. They were flogged. They were stoned to death. They faced false accusations and corrupt officials. There were storms and shipwrecks and snake bites and all of those things seem intended to stop the spread of the gospel, but the gospel is unstoppable. It's a bit like this. Here's a picture of a a concrete path, strong enough to walk on, seemingly impervious. Here we see a small plant has found a way to grow up through that path. It's like the gospel. It finds a way. It's unstoppable. As we come to Acts chapter 28, you can imagine the devil thinking to himself, right, Paul, he's under house arrest. He's stuck in this house. Surely that will bring an end to all of this. And God laughs as he sends one person after another into that house to visit Paul and to hear about Jesus. In fact, from the rest of the New Testament, it seems that this two years of house arrest in Rome was a particularly fruitful period of ministry for Paul. Almost certainly it was during these two years that Paul wrote a number of his New Testament letters. One of those letters is in Philippians. Uh, And in Philippians chapter 1, Paul writes this about his imprisonment. He writes, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Those soldiers, those soldiers who were guarding Paul under house arrest, they were a captive audience. You can imagine, can't you? Each day the soldier rostered on to guard Paul arrives and Paul greets them and then tells them about Jesus. And when other people came to the house, the soldier would overhear what Paul said to them. It seems that one person that came to the house in this two-year period was the runaway slave, Onesimus. We read about that in Paul's letter to Philemon. Onesimus came to visit Paul and became a Christian. You can lock Paul up but you can't lock up the gospel. As Paul himself would later write, I am suffering to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. Friends, the gospel is unstoppable. It may be opposed, it will be. Some may reject it, many do. But ultimately, the gospel of Jesus cannot be stopped and that is, That is what Acts is all about. And this final episode, it's the perfect climax to that message. Uh, When Luke first wrote Acts, he wrote it in Greek. And in Greek, the last word of Acts is the word translated without hindrance. Uh, In some English versions, the order of the sentence gets swapped around to make it easy to understand in English But the last word of Acts is the word without hindrance. What a great conclusion to this book. What a clear reminder that the gospel is unstoppable, like migrating wildebeests or a river rushing down a mountain or a plant growing through a gospel path, uh, going through a concrete path. The gospel cannot be stopped. And this final episode, it's a great reminder of that. That's the first reason why I think this is the perfect ending to Acts. But there's a second reason too. And that is because this final episode concludes the book of Acts without finishing the story. Acts 28 is not the end of the story. The gospel 
is going to continue spreading after Acts 28. Uh, Look with me again at verse 28. Paul says, Therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Do you hear that note of confident expectation? They will listen. The gospel is going to continue spreading. In Acts 28, Paul has reached Rome. Rome at last. The gospel has made it all the way from Jerusalem to Rome. But Rome is not the ends of the earth. In many ways, Rome is the centre of the earth. You know that expression, all roads lead to Rome? Well, those same roads lead away to all. And so just as the gospel went from Jerusalem to all Judea, just as the gospel went from Antioch to all of the Mediterranean, so the gospel is going to go from Rome to all the world. Rome is not the end point of God's mission. It's just a stage on the way. The gospel was to continue spreading beyond Acts 28. And that, of course, is exactly what happened Within a few centuries of this, Christianity had become the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. Historians, sociologists today are still writing books about the incredible spread of the gospel, the explosive growth of the church in those early centuries. And friends, that growth, it continues today. Perhaps sometimes you feel like the church is in decline. Do you ever feel that? Well, did you know that in the last 100 years, the number of Christians in the world has nearly quadrupled? Let me give you some, some concrete examples of what that looks like. In 1949, it was estimated that there were 800,000 Christians in China. Today, It's estimated that there are 50 million Christians in China. In the last 25 years, the Indian Gospel League has planted more than 95,000 churches. 95,000, that's more than 10 new churches every day for 25 years. In Mongolia, In 1989, there were four known Mongolian Christians. Four. Today, there are more than 60,000. And in Iran, Iran. It's almost unimaginable. In 1979, there were an estimated 500 Muslim background believers in Iran. Today, there are hundreds of thousands. Some people say a million The gospel remains unstoppable and it continues to spread throughout the world. Acts 28 was never the end of the story. It's just the end of the beginning. There are lots more seasons to come. You know that feeling when you're reading a book and you get to the end, you get to the last line and then you turn over the page and you think, that That can't be the end. There's got to be more. Oh, I think we can get a feeling a bit like that when we read Acts. And I think that sense of incompletion that we might get, I think that's deliberate. It's as if Luke is inviting us to play our part in the ongoing story of the spread of the unstoppable gospel. There's no Acts 29 because... It's still being written, and we are to be part of it. Today, today, God is at work through his unstoppable gospel, bringing people from all tribes and languages and nations to trust and worship him. And our privilege, our privilege is to join him in that work. Will we join him? Here's our chance to be part of what God himself is doing in this world. Will we join him? The English author Oz Guinness recently wrote this. 
Our age is quite simply the greatest opportunity for Christian witness since the time of Jesus and the apostles. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that it's always easy or comfortable to tell people about Jesus. It wasn't easy or comfortable for Paul, and it won't be for us. We'll face opposition, we'll face rejection, but in the end, we can rest in the knowledge that the gospel of Jesus is unstoppable. This final episode of Acts, it's the perfect ending because it reminds us one last time the gospel is unstoppable and it invites us to play our part in spreading that message. So, what will we do? Do you know, I think one of the challenges of COVID for us as a church is in the area of outreach. But I suspect this may also be a time for us as a church to reset our outreach, to pray and talk and think together about how we can reach out with the unstoppable gospel of Jesus. As we, as we think ahead, perhaps this year we won't be able to do our normal gingerbread house nights. If not, if we can't, well, what will we do instead? Perhaps this year we won't be able to have a normal carol service. I hope we can. I love singing carols. But if we can't, how else might we use Christmas to point people to Jesus? If we can't do large-scale events, how could we use smaller group gatherings? Our circumstances, after all, they're gospel opportunities. So how will we use them? Can we find some videos that clearly explain Jesus and share them on social media? Can we find some books that will help people to engage with the gospel and give them as gifts? And what can we do when new people move into the area? What can we do to welcome them and point them to Jesus? How can we use our sign at the front of the church? How can we use our location near the shops? How can we use our website? Maybe you've got some good ideas. Is it the right time to go door knocking? Well, maybe not, but if not, what else can we do to boldly share Jesus with people? I want to urge us as a church to prayerfully consider how can we sharpen our gospel outreach. The gospel, it's unstoppable. It can't be quarantined. So how will we share it? And how can we spur each other on in this great task? How can we ensure that our love for Jesus and our concern for those who don't yet know him keeps growing? Friends, can I encourage you, after church this morning, to talk to one another about how we, together, might reach out with the unstoppable gospel of Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your incredible plan to save a people for yourself at great cost. We thank you, Lord, that the gospel did go out from Jerusalem to Rome to Australia into all the world. We thank you that it reached us and we pray that you would help us to be a part of your work in reaching others. Please, Lord, widen our vision and sharpen our focus and help us to spur each other on to make you known, that you might be worshipped as you deserve to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. song is called Cornerstone and it reminds us that Jesus is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. The cornerstone that is forgotten and trodden over by others, 
but I wonder how few in Australia and around the world have truly uh, come to hear Jesus in a way in which they can understand him. And that is our opportunity. Let's reflect on our cornerstone Christ now. Christ, our cornerstone, let's talk to our Heavenly Father in prayer now. 
Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Heavenly Father, your word says, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Forgive us, Lord, when we have taken our role as your image bearers to serve our own ends and not yours. Forgive us for when we fail to show love, mercy and forgiveness. We praise you that in Jesus we have one who has perfectly manifested your ways on earth and who has secured a path to you through his life, death and resurrection. Strengthen us in our faith that we will seek to follow you with all our hearts and make you and your love known to our world. We remember before you, our God and Father, the work produced by the faith of your servants around the world. Remember both theirs and our labour prompted by love and the endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We remember those who raised us in the gospel. We remember our kids' church leaders, our youth group leaders, our mentors, our friends who have inspired, encouraged and helped us grow in the faith. Father God, as we move from our Acts series after almost 12 years, let us not depart from its truths. Let us remember, let us intimately know and boldly share our risen Lord Jesus. Let us be strengthened by your Holy Spirit, surrendering our autonomy and self-rule to your far superior sovereignty over our lives, your far superior rule. Let us remember the early church and her commitment to you, Lord Jesus, to each other and to the known world at the time. Let us remember the gospel for which they lived, loved, travelled, gave of their time, their money and desired all people to know. Let us hold like them the things of this world loosely and the things of you, our living Lord, tightly and for all time. As some travel on holidays, may they speak of you on the road, at their destination, and as they connect with people known to them and those who are new to them. Father God, help us to seize the opportunities that uh, a break from the term will bring for many, to connect with people, not, not just in an ordinary way, but in an extraordinary way that only you can facilitate, but help us to step into those opportunities and to be prepared for them now. Refresh us in the gospel that we might refresh others. Enable us to live by your strength and for your honour as we set out into this day, into this week and beyond. Help us to be encouraged, challenged and inspired by those who have gone out into all the world. We praise you for those whose hearts have been captured by the whole world and the desire to share Jesus with those who have limited or no opportunity to hear of your great and lasting work. We thank you for the pals who are concluding their time in Peru. We thank you for the opportunities that they've had to strengthen local church leaders. Father, we thank you for the Snowdens and their ongoing work in Spain. Strengthen their witness in this increasingly secular country and this country that is navigating COVID restrictions. Be with the Kingdons serving in Western Australia. We're thankful that there is less restrictions for COVID there and we pray that they'll be able to seize those opportunities and the people that are perhaps held over there and unable to travel back to other places might have more opportunity to hear of Christ. We thank you for Bridget's ongoing work in South Africa. We thank you for some of the COVID challenges that she has navigated, and we pray, Lord God, for open doors and ongoing gospel opportunities. We praise you for Phil and Lil and their family serving in Southeast Asia in gospel translation, and we pray, Lord God, that you'll continue to use them to bring uh, your word in the heart language of the people there. Thank you for Steve, Erin and Zach, uh, here on home assignment, but heading home uh, very soon to Central Asia. Thank you for their time here. Thank you, Lord God, that you are going ahead of their time in Central Asia. Please be setting up uh, wonderful opportunities for the gospel and helping them to adapt and adjust back to life in Central Asia. Finally, we thank you for Erin and Matthew serving in Ireland. Uh, Lord God, we thank you that they're now moved into Northern Ireland. We thank you uh, for their new home and the new opportunities in the new church. We pray that you will bless their relationships, 
uh, with new people. We pray that they'll be able to connect well with the Christians, but also start to build bridges with their neighbours and others in the community. We pray for these and other Christians serving in countries where there is increased hostility to the gospel, and especially for those around the world who suffer, who face suffering, danger and persecution. Strengthen your people for their witness and work in the world. Fill each of your missionaries, ministers and servants with your spirit that they and we may all faithfully preach the gospel. Unite in the truth all who profess your name, that we may live together in love and proclaim your glory in all the world. Loving God, we pray for ourselves as we look to grow in our knowledge and love of you as our creator, as we look to bring our lives into sync with you and your plans for us. In our world marred by sin and the breakdown of relationship with you and each other, we especially pray for the unloved and the persecuted, the marginalised, those who are hurting and lonely. Perhaps uh, some who are struggling with unhappiness in marriage or singleness, or those suffering from divorce or abuse. Father, you know those close to us that are struggling with these things, and you know our own struggles. God, we know that such pain was not part of your good design for us, and we ask that we will draw strength from Jesus and from your community, the church. Father, we know we praise you that you use suffering and struggle for good purposes. We thank you for the way that you used the Apostle Paul and you used his hardships for the gospel, and we offer our hardships to you that you might bring gospel fruit from them in our lives and in the lives of others. Be our strength and comfort in every difficulty and struggle. Enable us all to experience your generous love and be renewed in our relationship with you. Finally, we thank you for the history of St. David's and the growth of the gospel here since the 1950s. We pray, Lord God, that you will continue to strengthen your people here today by your word, that we might digest it, continue to discuss it, and be shaped by it. Father, we pray that we will uh, be diligent in our weekly Bible studies to invest in each other. We pray that we'll finish the term well and be an encouragement to each other even when we're on a break. Strengthen our daily Bible reading. Give us a desire and a hunger for your word that trumps and, and pushes away other desires and longings. Help us to find refuge and strength in you and your gospel, that we might be a strength and a witness to others. Give us energy to serve our community in addition to those who are directly in our daily sphere. Let our acts of kindness adorn the gospel words that we have opportunity to speak. Help us not to shrink from the interest in Jesus that continues in our community and even now more so when the world's security measures fail them in these current times. We commend to your keeping, Father, ourselves and each other, our families, our neighbours, our friends, our community and those far off. Enable us by your spirit to live in love for you and for one another. Amen. A handful of announcements for us, things in the life of our church. Uh, maintenance day coming up Monday the 5th of October, 8am to 12pm. I think there'll be opportunities both indoors and outdoors. That's a chance to spruce up things around our yard. Uh, digging deeper, uh, coming up on Tuesday the 13th of October. This is a chance for us to go deeper into a topic and it will set us up well for term four. We're, we're looking at the topic of deep truths that help us worship God and we'll be drawing on all sorts of things to do with God the Creator, Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit, what does it mean to be God's people. It's going to be a wonderful series uh, and many of the Bible study groups will be following this along. There is uh, books available up the back. There's a table under the final air conditioner at the back that has our study Study books for term four. Uh, you can buy those for seven dollars for individual um, benefit, uh, for meeting with somebody else, or as part of a small group. Leaders can take a bundle and just note how many and sort out payment um, later next term. Uh, new roster will be coming out this week, so if you have, this is your last 24 hours today, right through to about this time tomorrow, to let us know if you have holiday dates that you need to block out or changes that you need to make to the roster. It is. 95% done, so, um, but do let us know because we don't want to put you on if it's as simple as changing you a week. Speaking of holidays, I'm going on leave for a couple of weeks, um, so I just thought that's helpful to know. Uh, we're going to uh, 
is our final song as a reflection. Uh, these, listen to the words of this song, All I Have is Christ. Uh, I love the way that this song is presented with such um, uh, energy and devotion. So let's reflect on that. I once was lost in darkest night Yet thought I knew the way The sin that promised joy and love That led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own A will to your will And if you had not loved me first passionate. Uh, Paul has made it to Rome. But Rome was never the end point for the gospel. Where was the end point? This was. The whole thing. God wanted the gospel to go everywhere. He wanted to go to Mongolia, Iran, China, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, Peru. He wants it to go to your next door neighbours. He wants it to go on holidays with you and to come home. And he wants it in the workplace and all around the place. The gospel doesn't end in Rome. The gospel continues. And we have a brilliant ending to the book of Acts. The baton has been handed on. The Holy Spirit is in us. 
and we have this great gospel to pass on to others. Listen to what Paul wrote at the end of Ephesians, a prison letter written from Rome. Pray also for me that whenever I speak words may be given to me, that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. Let's take up the challenge to talk about that now and encourage each other in knowing the gospel and making it known and how we can do that this week as we go from here. Amen.